When we last left Robert Stark, he had just recently been enlightened by his moral leader Luke Ford. Now he comes to Inglewood, Los Angeles, a desolate patch of strip malls and fast food joints surrounded by freeways in hopes of receiving not only moral enlightenment, but sexual enlightenment. Oh. Just filming. Okay. Are you nervous for your meeting with uh, Dr. Block? All right, I'm here today with um, Robert Stark and Dr. Susan Block. Um, we're here at, um, what's it called? Bonoboville? Bonoboville. B lovely Bonoboville. Um, and we're, today we're going to be talking about um, incels and um, the relationship between politics and sex and whatever else we get around to talking about. Thank you very much for having us, Susan. And oh, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> go right on ahead and ask the first question, Robert. Robert. Yes, uh, Dr. Sue. Uh, this incel thing is, uh, it's been an online movement for quite some time, and it's made major news headlines. First, there was a major attack in Santa Barbara with Elliot Roger, and mm. uh, more recently in Toronto with a van attack with uh, Alex uh, Manassian. And it's a growing uh, online community of just really angry, uh, alienated men. Uh, Susan, why do you think this scene is growing? And you wrote an article for uh, Counterpunch about this, about solutions. What do you see as reasons why this is a growing either a phenomenon or just an online subculture? And what are your prescriptions? Okay, Robert. Well, first of all, incel. What does it mean? It means involuntary celibate. And, yeah, usually these are men. Could be a woman, but usually if a woman wants to have sex, she can have it. Uh, there's a lot of men who want to have sex, but for one reason or another, they don't get it. And some of them... Uh, identify with this involuntary celibate, this incel movement of men who are kind of angry about it. And yeah, sometimes that anger erupts into the most horrific, misogynist, inexcusable mass murder. And sometimes it's just a simmering frustration. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's everything in between. And it does seem that it is increasing for various reasons. You know, we here in America, we see it as kind of a privileged white male phenomenon, and to a great degree it is. But to some degree, the phenomenon of incel, involuntary celibates, is going on all over the world in different religions, different races. Of course, we're all the human race. The whole race thing is a bit of a fantasy in and of itself. But in any case, it's going on all over the world in all different cultures. And yet we have a particular incel culture here in America that does seem to be growing. And, and the resentment is growing. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, um, men and women and all kinds of people, just feel that this is nothing but evil and toxic masculinity. And I'm not so sure they're wrong, <laughs> but I do know if that's how we regard this growing movement, it ain't going to get any better. <laughs> it's going to get a lot worse. And although I'm not in favor of most of what the incel movement's leaders and, and most of the posters, and they are 
very active on the internet. I, I guess it started before the internet, but it seems to have exploded with the internet. And yes, with Elliot Roger, the supreme gentleman, and Alec Manassian, who seems to have been, uh, have some difficulties. I think a lot of the incel uh, people are, um, you know, they're, they have different reasons that they can't get laid, uh, whether it's economic or because of how they look, or maybe they're autistic, like I've heard that Alec uh, Manassian is, although I'm not sure, but I, I've heard that he is, or they have other issues, um, uh, or maybe they have anger issues, <laughs> really. They might, you know, it's a chicken or the egg thing sometimes. What comes first? Are you an angry man so you can't get laid? Or you can't get laid so you become an angry man? Uh, well, I think we need to look at this as a society. No, I do not think that any woman owes any man sex. I do not think we should have, uh, you know, mercy sex with incels. Unless we're really in the mood, you know. Uh, but I do think that we as a society, as, as human civilization all over the world, civilization that has come about in the last 12,000 years, because I don't, I don't think this thing is, uh, is brand new. It just has a new spin, and then it has the Internet. But I don't think it's new at all. I think it started, I guess, with civilization and with private property and with some men being the so-called alpha males and getting all the girls and girls being slaves and all these bad things. Anyway, um, it's evolved or devolved, if you want to call it that, into what we call the incel phenomenon, movement, um, poison. And if we as a society don't handle it, it's just going to get worse. And I think, you know, there are probably a lot of different ways to handle it. My way is the bonobo way. So, I don't know if you want to know about that. Well, it's interesting you bring that up, because <laughs> uh, I've watched a lot of your videos about the bonobo way. Yeah. And one theme I hear a lot about, I did research on incel blogs and just the whole sort of general uh, manosphere, uh, subculture, and they have all these theories that say that sexual uh, libertinism, sexual liberation, leads to a higher status men monopolizing more women. Are you familiar with those theories? Yeah, I'm familiar with those theories, and I, I, I kind of disagree with them. I think there's so many aspects of human civilization that lead to higher status men, that means men with money, men with property, uh, getting more sex, you know, they're, they're, sex has become a commodity, you know, sex, we should all have sex, actually libertinism says sex should be for everyone, why should it just be for the rich, why should it just even be for the good looking, why shouldn't everybody be sexual, I mean, it's like food, maybe not as basic, you know, but pretty basic. We all deserve to have some kind of sex. Maybe not all the same kind of sex, and there are many kinds of sex. And herein is where I think that human civilization, again, is kind of responsible. Human civilization says there's only certain kinds of sex that are okay. There's only certain kinds of sex that a man can have and be masculine. And, you know, that's very limiting. So not only do we have, you know, rampant, out-of-control capitalism. I mean, I'm not against a little bit of capitalism. I'm a capitalist. I, I, I'm, a, I'm all for making some money and having some things. But if we don't have some socialism, you know, you have rampant capitalism with respect to property, with respect to health care, with respect to food, maybe with respect to water very soon, maybe with respect to the air we breathe, and certainly for 12,000 years with respect to sex. Huh. And that ain't fair. That ain't libertine. That's just messed up. Huh. 
So could you describe then uh, the bonobo way? What it, is your solution? What does adding a little bit of socialism into the mix look like on a sexual uh, basis? Yeah, sure. Well, I am a very uh, much of a bonobo advocate. Bonobos are the make love not war chimpanzee, uh, just in case you don't know a bonobo from a banana. Uh, bonobos um, are our closest cousins along with common chimpanzees. Uh, they are 98.7% genetically similar to us humans. Uh, we're apes and they're apes and they're closer to us than gorillas or orangutans. And, uh, and, and they really have just been discovered in about 1930. And because they are so sexual, they haven't been studied very much. So we're just learning about them, which maybe gives us some excuse for not knowing too much about bonobos. But now we are getting to know bonobos. And we should go bonobos, as I often say. Make like bonobos, not baboons. Okay, so aside from being very close to us, what else is very significant about bonobos? They have a lot of sex, uh, all kinds of sex, not just, you know, male, female, penis, and vagina sex. They have lots of oral sex, both ways. They have a little bit of anal sex. They have lots of caressing and kissing and massage and licking all over the place and stuff you could say, fetishes. They are bisexual. Uh, lots and lots of sex. They're kind of swingers or polyamorous, depending on how you want to interpret, that they're not exactly monogamous, although they might have a good friend that they regularly have sex with. They don't just stick to one. Um, number three, females rule Bonoboville. I ain't just talking about the Stacys. I'm talking about the MILFs. I'm talking about not just the young, fertile females, although they have a lot of power in Bonoboville, but, and when I say Bonoboville, I mean, you know, the jungle where bonobos are uh, native in the Congo and also very endangered. So if you like anything I'm saying, please support the bonobos and help to save them from extinction so we can learn more about them. Uh, and when I say Bonoboville, I also kind of mean humans that like bonobos and, and that are inspired by bonobos. Not that we do everything bonobos do. We don't live in trees, uh, but we do find inspiration in the bonobo way. So number four, uh, the males are happy. You might say, uh, I think maybe some incels might say, well, with the ladies in charge, that's not fair to the guys. But hey, the guys are happy. The guys studies have shown are healthier and stay youthful longer than their common chimp counterparts. They're laid back. Why is that? Because they're getting laid, not just by females, often by older females, but the younger ones too, but also by each other. <laughs> so, you know, there's lots of opportunities to be sexual in Bonoboville. Um, they also masturbate. No problem with that. That's a considered an option for sex. And yeah, there are no incels in Bonoboville. Now maybe there's some exception, but I don't. I don't really think so. I've never. I've never heard about that. Bonobos are sexual. They, the, sex is something like breathing, eating, playing. Everybody does it to some degree. They don't always do intercourse. They don't always do it like a Chad, so to speak. But they have something. They have something. So. I, uh, that, that's number four. Number five, there has never been seen a bonobo killing another bonobo in the wild or captivity. Bonobos make peace through pleasure. So all of this stuff that I've just described somehow keeps there from being not just a mass murderer, but any kind of murderer. And by the way, common chimps do murder. Common chimps do make war, not as bad as humans not anywhere near. Nobody's as bad as humans. But yeah, I mean, well, you could say humans have a common chimp side and a bonobo side in a way. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we get our murderous side, you could say, from our common chimps. They, they do make war. Bonobos do not. Bonobos, so far, 
I'm not saying now that they've been exposed to human civilization that they might not change. Change. These are very intelligent creatures, even according to our standards of intelligence. And I would say, if you use a different standard of intelligence, like keeping the peace, they're more intelligent. Uh, if you use a different standard of, standard of intelligence, like sexual equality, or maybe it's not total equality, but it is sharing of sexual pleasure, they are more intelligent. And yeah, they, um, they are inspirational. Hmm. So what would um, making human society more like bonobo uh, society, what, what changes could be instituted? How would that map out onto human civilization? Okay. So number one, there is just learning about bonobos and keeping them from going extinct, which is very difficult now with all the global <coughs> warming and all these, there's so many species going extinct every single day. Please, let's try not to have one of them be the bonobos. And number two, recognize the sex. Yeah, sex is important. Sex is vital. Sex is not just something some be people get to have. Mm -hmm. And sex, the definition of sex, needs to be expanded. Because otherwise, yeah, it's all about procreation. It's all about penis and vagina. Um, you know, our religious groups, and I have great respect for religions. I, I'm into all of the religions. But, you know, they kind of define sex as uh, procreation only. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and bonobos show us that that's not natural. You know, a lot of people say, oh, human bisexuality, human transsexuality, human pansexuality is unnatural. But uh, let's just say, no, bonobos show us that it is natural. In fact, the Latin name for bonobo is pan paniscus. They are the apes of Pan, Pan being uh, the lord of the wild, Pan being the god of nature, Pan being our, our animal self. And yes, the church took Pan, the god of uh, Greece, and called Faunus by the Romans, and turned him into the devil, hmm. into Satan, with the horns and the tail. That's Pan! That's our animal nature. That's our hmm. sexual nature. And when we turn pan into the devil, when we turn all forms of sex, you know, that don't involve procreation, married sex, uh, then, you know, everything is the devil. Hmm. And, and no wonder we have all of this violence, and no wonder we have incels, and no wonder we have resentment, and no wonder we also have women being harmed. And let's get on to the women. Okay. Bonobos show us, that's the number three, that female equality or maybe even supremacy, female, you know, femocracy in a way, is uh, natural too. And yeah, you could say it's a matriarchy. People, the primatologists, I'm not really a primatologist. I'm a sex therapist and a sexologist. But the primatologists kind of have different opinions as to whether the bonobos are matriarchal or just kind of equal. And definitely the females get first dibs on the food, so that's important. The males tend to be in charge of the perimeters and defending against uh, problems, you know, predators that come in, although they don't have a lot of predators in the jungle because they stay up in the sky. The predators now are really humans trying to shoot them. Uh, but uh, the females also get to choose their sex partners. They do uh, have a lot of power in that regard. And, um, you know, it shows that female choice when it comes to sex is perfectly natural. Female, even domination is kind of perfectly natural. Uh, so there you go. The males mm -hmm. are happy. We need to acknowledge that. We need to take a leap of faith in some ways. and let the gals have a little more power, not just the gals, but the feminine side of all of us. And know that at least with the bonobos, it does mean no killing. I'm not sure if that's where it would go with humans, but you can't be killing while you're coming. So, <laughs> you know, I, I do feel that uh, there is, needs to be a many-pronged approach to the quote-unquote incel 
issue. Uh, because incels are different. There's, there's many different reasons that guys, and for the most part they are guys, uh, aren't getting laid when they want to. And by the way, there are celibates who want to be celibate, but incels are involuntary celibates. And so there's many different solutions. I think all of them are dem demonstrated by bonobos. Uh, one of those is sex work, sex work being honored. Now, my opinion is that sex work is not just a human thing. Humans aren't the only prostitutes. There's prostitutes all over nature. There's all kinds of examples of animals that offer food for sex, that pay for sex, partly because the female is usually going to have some kids or, you know, and, and the male doesn't really know that, but there's an instinct to offer nourishment. And yeah, it, it goes on all through many, many different uh, types of, of animals. Uh, bonobos are a little different in that sometimes the female picks up the check. Um, they do have males that give food for sex. They also have females that give food for sex because the females have the power. Whoever has the power, whoever has the mangoes or the coconuts or the bananas or whatever, is the, method, the, the, the means of currency. Whoever has the valuable thing, if they exchange it for sex, they're kind of like the John or the Jill. And so bonobos, the females do it. But yeah, the males do it too. The males, if they come up with some food, they give it to the females. So sex work is very, very natural. It is not some human perversion. Uh, that being said, uh, it's also the oldest human profession, uh, so it's been with us a long time. And yet, as soon as it became a profession, which is probably when, you know, I guess, well, it probably became a profession before civilization, I would say, since animals do it and bonobos do it. But eventually it became something bad. Let's just say, I guess, when religion started to come in and try to get everybody to have sex only for procreation, uh, and, and also, you know, these um, one god uh, religions that tried to say that the temple prostitutes were bad, bad, um, you know, the horrors of Babylon. And so we have this idea, not only is sex illegal, I mean sex work, not only is sex work illegal, but it's very, very bad. It's going to send you to hell. It's, it's just something that stigmatized. So my feeling is if sex work was legalized, decriminalized, and destigmatized, it would help a lot with incels. Hmm. Because Lord and Lady knows incels need sex work, <laughs> right? Because there aren't enough women that just want to have sex with these guys. Just obviously not. They're involuntary celibates. And yeah, some of them are closet gays and they should be encouraged to come out of the closet and get in touch with their homosexuality or bisexuality or transsexuality. A lot of them resent women because they really want to be women. But there are some who just, they need some sex. Huh. Why shouldn't they have sex workers work with them? I mean, why shouldn't sex work be okay? Uh, you know, just like, uh, I mean, I think it would help with the Me Too movement if more executives could, you know, like just have a sex worker come in, just like they go to a fine restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, if it wasn't stigmatized, sure they can afford it, but it's stigmatized. Yeah. Now yeah. we come to they can afford it. Some can afford it, some can't. Some incels are broke. They're living in their parents' basement and their parents are not going to pay for a sex worker. This is where my socialism comes in. And I do believe that sex work should be subsidized by our government. <laughs> I do. Yeah, yeah. Just like food stamps, we should have sex work stamps. All right, so the, definitely an extremely interesting answer. Um, I think what 
people w would argue against that in the so-called uh, men's rights um, circles would be that, um, in fact, since there has been more sexual liberation in the West or in the U.S., however you want to put it, um, that we've seen a lot more incels and a lot more um, sexual inequality. I don't necessarily have statistics to back that up, but that's definitely a widespread perception amongst incels. And what they would probably argue, you, you sort of argued um, against uh, the sort of monogamy promoted by religion. I think uh, well, an argument I've heard is that that's actually a natural form, or not a natural form, but a, uh, a type of sexual socialism by which everyone is uh, afforded one partner. And if everyone's pairing off like that, the theory would be that everyone have a partner. And the theory would be that um, in a sexually liberated society um, where everyone, and all women especially, I guess, are told that they can and should have sex with whoever they like, they're all going to tend towards um, high status men, whatever that might mean, whether they um, have a lot of money or property, as you pointed out, or also even just um, are, are extra strong or, or the best looking. Um, the argument would be that we... You know, like on Tinder, for example, I've heard statistics about um, it's only a, a small percentage of guys that get a lot of the matches. Um, I guess my question would be, do you think some of that is myth? Or if not, what is there, is there, are there other problems that are, that are creating that, throwing a wrench in the ideal of sexual liberation and uh, sexual equality? Wow, well, there's a lot of questions there. Yeah. <laughs> so, number one, I want to say I'm not against monogamy. I'm kind of monogamous myself. I mean, actually, what I call myself is monogamish. <laughs> uh, I mean, I have a husband. I've been married for over 27 years. Uh, you know, we're monogamish. We have a semi-open, but not totally open. You know, we, I, I, I certainly understand humans wanting to be monogamous. And I think that's great. But what if you don't? What if you don't? Why should you be forced? Isn't that a kind of slavery? And I, I guess I don't think that a kind of slavery like that is um, a good outcome of the enforcement of you have to have your sex only in monogamous marriages. Uh, I think usually women are the ones to suffer in those cases, but certainly men suffer too. I don't think that uh, that... I, I think it's almost like the whole idea of make America great again. Like, uh, like people think that there was some great time in the past. Uh, okay, so yeah, everybody would pair off with somebody. Um, you know, as a sex therapist, I can't tell you how many men I talk to who tell me they got married when they were 18 and uh, they had to get married because they had sex with this woman at the same age and they were forced into this marriage and it's been terrible and, and it's sexless now and now they have kids and, and they're, they're, they're just miserable. So, mm. And that's from the man's point of view. <laughs> and I know it's, even, it's, it's much worse from a lot of women's point of view, but I, I just don't think that forced marriages are are a good uh, solution to the sexual problems that we have. And I, I do think that there were a lot of sexual problems in the past uh, with, with forced marriages. And by the way, not everybody got to get married. By the way, you still needed to have property and be wealthy. And then and, 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 and your parents might arrange it, sure. But, but if you didn't have parents, maybe you wouldn't get married. I don't think that it took care of everybody by any means and certainly didn't consider people's feelings. Mostly considered parents and community feelings, not individual feelings. Hmm. So I, I kind of feel like I, I, I definitely sympathize with a lot of the incel frustration. Uh, and, and yet I, I guess I don't subscribe to the idea that, that, that things were better in Victorian times. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah, maybe you would be assured a wife if you had property, um, but otherwise, I don't know if you would be assured a wife. I, I don't think so, not according to my Charles Dickens reading. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think a lot of guys were, were not assured a wife. Um, and then there was also the problem, excuse me for mentioning it to the incels, but of women being very much enslaved uh, by the system. So my feeling is, 
the sexual revolution did not go far enough. Yes. That is my feeling. I feel like, yeah, it's, it's nice, you know, that, uh, that people could have sex outside of only reproductive sex within marriage, that you could have some recreational sex. Mostly, I think it's positive for guys. I mean, girls still get called sluts. Guys get called studs. Yeah, there's certain ways in which it's better for gals. You know, you could say we have this book, Our Bodies, Ourselves, that we got. We kind of learn more about female anatomy. Uh, but, you know, mostly women uh, from the sexual revolution don't get as much benefit as men. But, I mean, we still get some benefit. And I would never turn back the clock on the sexual revolution. I'm all for the sexual revolution. I just think it needs to go farther. I think it needs to go bonobos. Yes. Um, I have a question uh, related to that that I'll just jump right into because it, it relates. Um, you said that uh, you feel that in many ways it hasn't gone far enough, especially for women. And I get that. But is there a way, would there be a way of um, wording that where maybe it hasn't gone far enough for um, the feminine in us all, maybe, um, because I, I just think I've, one, I, I heard a lo long time ago, um, on this podcast, the Bretty Stanellis podcast, if you know who that is, he was interviewing the Canadian pop artist Peaches, if you know who she is, um, and she, uh, she said, uh, at some point that she, she doesn't think that men ever really got their sexual revolution in the way that women did. This being related to specifically male homosexuality, mm. male femininity, male submissiveness. That there is kind of a double standard where, um, you know, obviously strides have been made for LGBTQ rights in the past 10 um, years. But there still is arguably a little bit more of a stigma for, you know... Yeah. Uh, a male to come out, come, to come out as bisexual, for example, um, or to simply just be more um, feminine or or submissive. So, are you at all um, amenable to that? Yeah, I agree with her. I mean, as I said, I think there are many ways in which it didn't go far enough for men, and it didn't other ways in which it didn't go far enough for women. Certainly, in that sense, it didn't go far enough for men. Certainly, in the sense of getting in touch with your feminine side, if you were happen to be born with a penis. Uh, whether that means, you know, you, whatever that means. I mean, it could mean all the way to trans. It could mean just wearing pink. I mean, it, it, it means so many different things. And, and, yeah. and yeah, I do think it's better. I mean, I think uh, a lot of guys do wear pink. And there is more of an acceptance of our trans brothers and sisters of all genders. And there is more of an acceptance, but again, I don't think it's gone far enough. I do think that this is because, even though there's been a sexual revolution, there has not been a, a revolution in terms of thinking that being masculine is superior. And as a matter of mm -hmm. fact, a lot of women are getting in touch with their masculine side. That's what a lot of the feminism it's I see. It's cool, you know, it has, it's yeah. good. Sometimes... It hurts my heart to see women making war on small countries, or <laughs> it hurts yeah. my heart to see women as, uh, you know, mass murderers, which we are seeing now. Um, and that's because, yeah, women are not special, uh, different in some way that makes us that different from men. Women are not from Venus, and men are not from Mars. We're all from the same beautiful sexual planet Earth. We're far more alike than we're different. We each have a masculine and feminine side and, and mixed up sides and trans sides. And, uh, and I think we, we need to accept our fluidity if we want to be a peaceful society. Yeah, that's so interesting that you should say that because um, to get a little bit personal, I mean, I, I would say I used to be um, very, very liberal. And one thing that kind of I wouldn't necessarily identify as a conservative now, but one thing that I felt kind of pushed away from a lot of the current liberal trends is is the way that feminism is presented and the way that it, in many ways it does seem like all that we've really been able to do is kind of allow women more into traditionally masculine roles. Um, it's just not, you know, that that's a perception I see a lot in kind of mainstream um, feminism. And there's well, this I kind of I sense... I can bring you back to feminism. <laughs> there's always two strains of feminism. It's important to note this. The pro-sex feminists, who tend to like men. I mean, we could be lesbian or bisexual, but we tend to, you know, like guys, at least as friends. And then there's the anti-sex feminists, who are 
you know, have problems with men and, and have problems with sex. And I guess you could say the Carrie Nations and Andrea Dworkins, mm -hmm. Catherine McKinnons are more in the anti-sex, you know, camp. Uh, the pro-sex feminists, um, more like uh, Emma Goldman, was it Emma Goldman? I don't want a re revolution I can't dance to. I'm a pro-sex feminist. Yeah. And I'm a feminist. I believe in, in female, hey, I'm almost a femocracist, fe femocratic. I, I'm almost that. I, I definitely believe in female empowerment. That's an important aspect of the bonobo way. But an equally important aspect that some feminists forget is male well-being. There's yeah. got to be male well-being. If there's not, it all goes to poo-poo. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, not to whine, but a lot of what I've experienced has been downright mean on, like, my college campus. Oh, yeah. The sense of, you know, and they bring race into it as well, of course. You know, um, all, all white men are evil, no more white men. This is something that a lot of people in my generation um, kind of, kind of uh, came up with. And I think it's creating a lot of real social problems right now related to incels too a little bit where it's just this general sense of these people you know are somehow are so privileged that they don't deserve any sympathy on anything you know when you go bonobos you realize we all deserve sympathy we're we're all human apes you know and and we're struggling because we are apes and and who knew that this giant brain of ours that we developed would get us to this point of of crazy you know, interwebs and and machines taking over our lives and, and, and this controlled sexuality. So we all have struggles. We, we, have to, we have to have empathy and sympathy for each other, I think. Hmm. Wonderful. Robert, do you want to jump in with a few yeah, questions? Yeah, this issue has to do with the subject of uh, gender roles, but I'm going to tie it back in with the incel issue. So as far as uh, oral sex goes, there seems to be a disparity where, uh, where uh, men are more often to expect fill audio, but there's a less... Felatio. I'm a sex therapist, I can correct you. <laughs> well, I think, I think, isn't that the proper Latin pronunciation, fill audio? Yeah. Well, oh, I don't know. Anyhow, well... But I mean, fellatio is what everybody says. Yeah. Anyway, Us yeah. Usage dominates, Yeah. <laughs> But anyhow, like, you say Felicio <laughs> and I say Felicio. <laughs> Let's call the whole thing. Oh. Okay. Anyhow, cuddlingus Cuddling. is okay. less less expected, and there are these uh, like oral sex disparities, and that's actually been written about. Mm. Is there statistics to back that up, and why do you think that is? Okay, first of all, you're the one that's coming to me with this, so I would hope you'd have the statistics. I don't know. What, what are you trying to say? That, that men get more head than women? Is that what you're trying to say? That's a general perception that I've heard, and I've, I have not found the specific statistics. Okay, well, neither people... do I. I don't know. I, I know that, you know, everybody seems to want more oral sex. I mean, yeah. but, you know, there's issues. There's issues in both regards. People have issues with oral sex. Oral sex is a great act of intimacy. Now, men tend to have, well, tend to, they have their genitals on the outside. That's the big difference, actually, between men and women, as I see it. I mean, yeah, there's the testosterone, that's a factor, you know, men have more of that. We have testosterone, too, though, and it definitely motivates us. If we don't have any, we want some. <laughs> but certainly, our genitals are mostly inside, and we do have this vulva that is very sensitive, is in many ways they say more sensitive because it has more nerve endings than the penis. But the clit, the clitoris, is, you know, like a little penis. And it's very sensitive. And uh, it's just hard to see. I mean, if you don't have, uh, if you're not shaved, which, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people that are shaved. But, yeah, if you're natural, you, you got hair all over there. You can't see it. The man has a penis that sticks out. He doesn't even have to take his clothes off and it, he can just unzip his fly and there it is. So, I don't know, maybe that's one of the reasons that uh, fellatio might be more popular than cunnilingus. Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't think that one is dominant or the other is submissive. 
you know, some people might regard giving oral sex as submissive. But hey, if you're down there, you can bite it. So mm -hmm. to me, that's, you know, a lot of power. I, I don't know that it's always submissive to give oral sex. Um, I know one thing. Bonobos have a lot of oral sex, both ways. They do the licking, they do the sucking. I don't know who has more, the males or the females, because they're all naked and they're all hairy, maybe it's kind of equal. Um, and so, you know, maybe it does have something to do with a good society to have a lot of oral sex both ways. Hmm. Well, you made an excellent point. So, uh, yeah, there's that issue of intimacy with uh, cunnilingus. Mm. Do, you, do you think that uh, the idea, so... A lot of men will just let uh, any girl uh, basically blow them. Mm -hmm. Do you think the concept of basically uh, casual or no strings attached kind of lingus should be uh, destigmatized? Well, I never say should. Oh, well, destigmatized. Okay. I think all kinds of sex should be destigmatized. No strings attached. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Uh, I guess casual sex, uh, you know or let's say non-monogamous sex, certainly I think that should be destigmatized, whether it's oral or, or any kind of sex, as long as, you know, there's consensuality. Of course, consent is the main important thing, as well as safe sex. When you're having sex with different people, you need to practice safe sex. And, by the way, that should be called safer sex, since any kind of sex has a certain danger to it. And so does a lot of things. Eating has danger. You could get food poisoning. Hmm. But, yeah, sex is dangerous, so you should take precautions. So, yeah, oral sex is dangerous, too. I mean, there, there's all kinds of things you can get. And maybe that's one reason, is that, you know, having oral, giving oral sex to a man, you're, if you have a condom over it, especially if it's a nice, flavorful condom, <laughs> hey, it's okay. Now... Giving oral sex to a woman with a dental dam, eh, you know, I mean, some people are okay with that, and more power to them. Most people I know are not all excited about giving cunnilingus with a dental dam. So it does involve a certain exchange of body fluids, not something that would transmit the HIV virus, by the way, but other things, and yeah, you know, so I, I'm not... I'm all for safe sex, safer sex. And I will say, um, for some, when we talk about intimacy, of course, intimacy is, is an idea. It's a feeling. It's, it's hard to, to quantify or even qualify. It's something different to everybody. But I think a lot of us associate intimacy with our face and our brain. And some guys and girls, I would say equally, feel that intercourse is not as intimate as oral sex. That's why you'll find a lot of girls and guys will say, well, I'll have sex, I'll have intercourse, or, you know, but I'm not going to go down on that person, or I'll let them go down on me because my face isn't down there. But once my face is down there, you know, I'm French kissing your genitalia. And that is intimate. That is my face, my ears, my nose, the smell. You know, the smell is very much an important part of chemistry. And, you know, you don't smell so much if they're just here. But if they're, you're here, I don't know if I'm doing charades now. <laughs> but uh, if, if you're giving head, you know, you're more involved with the smell. You're more involved with the animal aspect. And a lot of people have issues with that. And you're more intimate. And a lot of people have issues with that. So it's interesting is that, well, this goes back to the whole uh, incel issue. So you have all these uh, incels are very uh, sexually frustrated. They feel really deprived. Then uh, as far as the whole cunnilingus issue goes, you hear a lot of bloggers, including a lot of feminist bloggers, complaining that not enough men will uh, go down on women. Do you think this issue of promoting cunnilingus can address both those issues? I think it could if everybody is consensual. You know, I, I think if uh, probably it would be a good idea for the woman, a woman, to, you know, hold a party and say, hey, I'm going to invite a bunch of men. They could be incels or, I don't know, guys she knows. Uh, and maybe she could put it on Tinder uh, and, and invite the women and, and let them have oral sex. 
Again, I think there's a safer sex issue going on, but if they want to work with that, I'm certainly not against it. And in fact, I would invite them to um, do it on my show if they don't want to be anonymous, or even if they do, they could wear a mask. And um, I think it sounds great. I, you know, I think <laughs> you should have a party like that. Like a social mixer, yeah. Sure, have one. <laughs> so just to go back to the, the topic of... The only thing is, <laughs> I would say that some of those feminist bloggers might not agree. They, they would probably say, well, I want my boyfriend to go down. I want my husband to go. I want the man that I love and that I'm going down. I don't just want any man to go down on me. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I haven't done the survey. And as I said, I'm totally open to what you're talking about. And by the way, some femdoms do just that. I do what we're talking about, have, might have a party in which certain very, very special submissive men are invited to go down on the femdoms. And yeah, it's quite a party. Mm -hmm. Oral sex, kind of linguist. And then of course they have linguini. Because after all, the root of the word kind of linguist, kind of linguist, <laughs> cunning. If you're a cunning linguist, you should know this, is cone, which is the Latin for, can I say cunt? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, vulva and uh, vagina, maybe the combination, and lingua, which is the same root as the word linguini, which is tongue. Uh, ah, mm. interesting. That's why linguini are like little tongues, you know. I had no idea words. that was connected. That's good, good knowledge. Like that, <laughs> um, I want to uh, jump in and ask a couple questions, a few questions about cuckoldry. Okay. If you're down for that. <laughs> so down. Yeah, I mean, you've been called one of the, the world's uh, foremost experts on cuckoldry. Yeah. Uh, I guess what I would ask is, um, yeah. Also, I wanted to just throw in the information that you do on your show. You can have you have people call in, and they sometimes yes. will talk to you about their cuckoldry uh, fetish uh, fantasies, and you sometimes even help them oh, yeah. plan plan them out. Um, but what would you say uh, about cuckoldry to demystify it for the average person who may think it's absolutely outlandish? And then I guess you can just answer that, and then I have another question. Yeah, and I do think it's another option for the incel community. Uh, so let's, let's define cuckoldry, first of all. The cuckold is the man. It's usually a man, although I guess it could be a woman. Cuckold dress. But, <laughs> yeah, cuckold dress. It's less uh, common. Uh, but uh, usually it's a man, and, and it's someone who... Uh, a cuckold usually has a wife, although could be a girlfriend, a significant other. Uh, there's also gay cuckolding, for that matter. But usually the idea is it's a man with a wife, and she has sex with another man, although it could be a woman. Um, so, yeah, cuckolding is that. Now, throughout civilized history, and again, we're starting, you could say, 12,000 years ago, although I guess the word really came into fashion around maybe just before Chaucer. Uh, it comes from the French, cuckoo. Uh, a bird that um, the it, it, that sometimes the the male bird will raise the children of another male bird, so to speak, because birds are sort of semi-monogamous, and uh, and so there's the cuckoo bird who is a cuckold, and yeah, I, I mean very often uh, it's a, a very consensual, but there has been this tone of uh, mockery when it's been used uh, in Western civilization. And uh, to some degree, that, that still exists. Uh, to some degree, there is still a tone of mockery when we talk about the cuckold, who has the horns. And by the way, the horns have nothing to do with an actual cuckoo bird. So I think that goes back to Pan with the horns, sexual, very sexual situation that is somewhat embarrassing, I guess. However, I have to say that cuckolding is one of the most popular male fantasies. It could be related to a male fear, or it could be related to a male pleasure. It's, it's just a way of looking at it. Um, also, of course, you could say that the hot wife, the woman who has more than one man, is one of the most popular female fantasies. And women like to have more than one man, yeah. And of course, both are very bonobo. And one of the elements is very biological. 
Uh, we call it sperm wars. I didn't invent that term, but I kind of used it a lot. Sperm competition. Uh, one thing that was discovered uh, in the 1990s when they looked at sperm under really big microscopes is that sperm is not like we used to think it was all runners running to the egg like in a marathon. No. Sperm is more like a football team or an army where there's different sperm that have different positions. Some of the sperm run to the egg and some of the sperm play offense or defense. And why is this sperm like an army or like a, a football team? Um, and I guess it explains why men like football more than women, but uh, okay. Partly it's, well, it's because they have to com do combat or fight against or play against other sperm. Well, not the same man's sperm, because why would he want to kill his own sperm? He doesn't. Another man's sperm. That's what they're there for. They're there to kill or to defend against the other man's sperm. And some of those sperm do have little toxins that they send off that can kill another man's sperm. So the idea here is that, yeah, humans probably, when our sexuality was uh, developing, uh, you know, many thousands, tens of thousands of years ago, was more like bonobos and common chimps. I mean, common chimps are like this too, by the way. They don't aren't monogamous. They might be violent and they're patriarchal, but they're not monogamous. And yeah, the females tend to have sex with more than one male, especially when they're in heat. Bonobos don't show their heat like humans. Bonobos hide their estrus, so they're more, you know, tricky females like humans. But Still, the whole idea of, of the other males enjoying a female who's having sex with more than one male is popular. The females call out to say, oh, I'm having sex, yeah, oh yeah, baby, oh God. You know, it's, it's to entice others to come. The idea is that you're not having sex with just one. And guess how that turns, that, that tunes into human sexuality, especially monogamy? Well. Of course, when a male is with a new female, he's always excited if they have chemistry, you know, assuming they're turned on. He's excited. She's new. Uh, you know, we might think it's just because she's new. It's also because he doesn't know if she's had sex with anybody else. She might say she's a virgin, but maybe she's not. Um, who knows? Maybe she had sex with somebody the other day. Who knows? So his brain sends a message to his testicles. It says, make the football team. We've got a game to play. Put out that army. We've got to win. And so the, the, the testicles fire up and, uh, and sperm goes into the semen and the semen is increased and the erection is increased because of the thing that the idea that she might have sex with another man. Um, and uh, not that they're thinking that, not that that's in the the conscious brain, you know, the brain is very mysterious in a lot of ways. A lot of stuff is not conscious. Of course, if you watch my sperm wars videos, then you know it. So it is conscious. <laughs> yes. But if you don't, you don't <clears throat> know it. In fact, guys get driven crazy by this because, of course, we're we're told we should be jealous. Guys should be jealous. Guys, should, this is emasculating. This is bad. This is not the way it should be. Uh, plus, of course, yeah, we are possessive. This is my property. This is capitalism. This, I own this woman. She should not be with someone else. But hey, I'm getting a hard on. I, I get excited by the idea of her being with another man. And sadly, when a man feels his wife is totally monogamous, when he feels she could never be with another man, he might love her. He might think she's the most beautiful woman in the world. He might still think she's beautiful. But the brain sends a message to the testicles that says, don't make the whole football uh -huh. team. You don't need to. We're the only ones on the field. So, yeah, his erection isn't as strong. It's, you know, what they considered um, just what happens when you're with someone a long time. It's not always what happens, though, because you can trick nature. And I think that one of the ways to trick nature is through the cuckolding phenomenon, whether it's for real, which I don't think it has to be, but it could be, and I'm all for the reality, but I'm also for stoking the fantasy, for, for enjoying the idea of, yeah, of non-monogamy, and, and that that might get you more excited than you would be if you just 
have this, you know, small football team. Mm -hmm. You want a big football team. <laughs> so, yeah, cuckolding is, is natural. It's, it's, not even, it, it's not even something weird. It, honestly, you know, when a guy watches porn, what does he usually watch? Penis. He's usually watching penis and vagina porn. He's watching a guy have sex with a woman he desires, with a woman who could be his girlfriend or his wife, and he's watching another guy. So, and I, actually, really up close to that is uh, gangbang sex. Guys love to watch guys. If guys didn't love to watch guys, then lesbian sex would be the most popular kind. Or just that POV, like, come on, baby, eat my pussy, or fuck me, I'm... I'm, you know, doing doing this just to you. That's popular, but it's not the most popular. The most popular is to watch a man have sex with a woman you desire, and that's cuckolding. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, and so I actually first heard of the concept of cuckoldry not as a sexual practice, but as a political metaphor and political slur uh, used by uh, what you might call the alt right or just certain con types of conservatives. But that's a that's what it's become very visible. Naughty, naughty, naughty. <laughs> it's become very visible as that over the past few years, people getting called cucks uh, or cuckservatives. They even well, I mean, uh, other yes. conservatives, usually um, specifically to um, against um, white males who, in their eyes, they don't uh, stand up for their identity politics interests sufficiently. Yes. That's basically what it means. So uh, I mean, it's not really a question, but what, do you have do you have thoughts on that? Um, I do. I, what, what's I, your yeah? Well, you know, as a sex therapist, I I try to help a lot of people. I try to, you know, as a socialist, help people for free on the show. But if you're going to be my private client, you have to pay. And uh, most of my private clients are very conservative people. Yeah. People that might use that language about someone that they feel is not conservative enough. I don't know, maybe I've taught them not to, if they're with me long enough. But they're also the primary people who are having cuckold fantasies, I have to say. Uh, or else I guess they can afford to talk, or they just can't talk to anybody about it. They're not, I mean, you know, you get the opportunity, since you're this quasi-liberal journalist, to interview someone about it. They don't get that. They, they, they're not open enough that they can open up and say, hey, I have cuckold fantasies. I mean, they can't. So they have to talk to someone like me about it. And, and actually, there aren't too many people like me. So there's not too many opportunities to really talk about it. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, I think it's probably more popular, and my colleague Dr. David Lay has done a, a study on this, it is more popular among conservative men. So related to the themes you talked about with, with feminism and um, incels and kind of men's rights versus female rights, there being conflicts with that, and also the whole cuck thing, not so much as a fetish, but as, um, as the word, as a political slur. What do you think, I've had this idea, and again, to, not to get too personal, but I've had this thing where I used to be more liberal and then I felt much more alienated by it. I kind of had this sense that um, a lot of kind of more feminine or more naturally submissive, because I would identify um, as, you know, like heteroflexible, <laughs> I know that's a term people kick around, a little more feminine in the way I present, a little more submissive. And I, I kind of had this, I, I've known this about myself for a long time, and that naturally led me towards more a little more liberal point of view, but I started to feel like um, the prevailing culture of sexual liberation, which maybe even square quotes sexual liberation, the prevailing culture of certain kind of feminism um, was actually very bad for um, what might be called uh, beta males, um, was actually kind of, it, it made it harder for me to, um, you know, find a long-term partner, or even find sex as a more feminine uh male i that was my honest perception i mean in college i was around a lot of well, you didn't live in the 50s they did not that's true you would not find it easier to find women as a more feminine male in the 50s believe me the 60s maybe the 70s that's when the sexual revolution happened and i i, I don't know i think there's a lot of women nowadays that are not looking for a high status male because the woman is high status, mm -hmm. because the woman has a lot of work to do, so she wants a male that's going to be helpful, not just some male she has to take care of because he's the high status one. Hmm. But women that are pro-sex feminists like men in touch with their feminine side, 
And yeah, they're, they're pro-sex. And by the way, a devil's triangle, just in case you're wondering, is not a beer game, even if a judge says it is. It's not. It's a threesome. And yeah, there's a certain element of cuckolding to it, and there might be an element of male bisexuality to it, because it's two males and a female, and it's very popular. Hmm. So okay. I don't know. I I think uh, I I I I don't know what girls you're hanging out with that want guys that are more masculine. Be maybe honest. maybe maybe you're just feeling what the culture tells you. Maybe you're just feeling self-conscious, even though you have a... That's because the bonobo way, the liberation hasn't gone far enough. You're in touch enough to know you're bisexual, and you, you think that women don't like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that that's true. Now, I will say women are subject to the same uh, culture that we all live in, which says, oh... You know, guys are supposed to be super masculine, and yeah, there's a more of an acceptance of female bisexuality these days, yeah. which is, you know, kind of, you know, kind of kinky for the guy. He likes that, and a lot of women are afraid. They're afraid because of what the culture tells us. You know, I talk to women, and and if they just go past their fears, they really enjoy male homosexual porn. Uh, but a lot of women are afraid, and they might be also afraid of the the safe sex angle because male sex often involves penetration and female female sex doesn't so often and so I guess there's a little bit of a sense that female female sex is is less dangerous than male male sex by the way male male sex doesn't have to be penetrative <laughs> um, and bonobos do show us another important thing which is foreplay, what we call foreplay or outer course, is maybe more important than intercourse. It's not just an appetizer. It's the spice of life. Hmm. And there's a lot to be done. And a lot of guys that are into other guys aren't necessarily all about penetration. Although some of them are, and that's okay too. Uh, but I think uh, women need some education about uh, guy bisexuality, no doubt. Mm -hmm. So there's this article that's been circulating uh, femdom blogs and forums. It's titled The History of uh, Face-Sitting. And there's a lot of claims that, uh, going back to ancient Rome, that high-status women used uh, servants for cunnilingus, that there were cunnilingus brothels, and also references to this uh, ancient empress in ancient China and Roman empresses. And just sort of the common practice of them in general. Are you familiar with this article? And are these rumors or is there historical accuracy? Oh, it's all rumors. You know, a history is written by the winners, as they say. So it's all rumors, uh, in my opinion. But I certainly have heard that the great Empress Messalina um, had uh, a lot of sex. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, she had servants going down on her. She had sex in brothels. Uh, she had orgies. Um, she had lots and lots of sex. She was the wife of Emperor Claudius, who had her executed. Unfortunately, I think she had some plot against the emperor. Uh, but in any case, there was uh, also the Empress Wu Hu, who I talk about in one of my books, um, The Ten Commandments of Pleasure, actually, about the great Empress Wu Hu, who, uh, according to certain histories, uh, would have uh, certain dignitaries bow before her and kiss her feet. And if you were a little bit higher up, you could um, you know, kiss her knees, I guess. And if you were a higher dignitary or perhaps a very important diplomat, you could give her cunnilingus, yes. Empress mm. Woohoo. Go, go. Woohoo! So uh, I have a book here. It's titled uh, Journey to Vapor Island. It's a uh, surreal science fiction, erotic, uh, dark comedy. I just want to add out a disclaimer. I do not endorse the all the language and behavior in the book. This is uh, pure fiction and satire. But it basically, it deals with all the themes that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So the major character in the book, Gnome, he's an incel, so sexual mm -hmm. frustration and eroticized rage, and not, not just sex, but just that 
feeling of alienation and wanting to prove to the world your status and your greatness. That's a major theme to the book. And there's a lot of online uh, meme references like uh, Chad's and that plays a role too. But it, it's very surreal and a lot of uh, dark comedy. So if you're easily offended, I would not recommend the book. But if you're if you have, if you have a really open mind to kind of exploring the dark side of uh, human psyche, I would recommend it. But another aspect is uh, femdom and uh, cunnilingus because there's this sort of secret society of high status women, and uh, they practice uh, femdom and cunnilingus. And there's an it starts out as a more as a social movement, but then it becomes much more uh, economic and then capitalism takes over and it becomes a very kind of a more profit oriented the profit kind of co-ops the sexuality and that also a uh, gnome writes this manifesto which is it is a very disturbing violent manifesto and it also and his manifesto also is deepest darkest sexual fantasies which uh, there are these two themes so he has a lot of this rage, uh, similar to a lot of these infamous uh, mass murderers that we discussed. But he's also, he's uh, bisexual, he's very obsessed with femdom, so he writes a lot about that. And then all his dark sexual fantasies get turned into this, like, theme park, and capitalism takes over, and it gets really crazy, but it, it does kind of introduce, there is this kind of theme in the book between the sort of higher status women and they decide to start using like lower status men and the role of uh, femdom and incels and how this all relates. So yeah, if you're just, if you're looking for a uh, dark comedy and exploring the dark side of the human psyche, I'd recommend this. But if you're easily offended, uh, I would not recommend it. But just a lot of the stuff in there, like just take into account that it's a satire and uh, not to be taken, uh, literally. Yeah, so that's uh, Journey to Vapor Island by Robert Stark, for anyone uh, watching. you've read it, Matthew. I have. <laughs> you want to just give kind of your brief recap? Oh, I mean, I think you, you recapped it pretty well, but it definitely does explore those themes you mentioned in a really interesting and, and fun and, yes, dark way. Um, I don't want to, like, be plugging your book, but necessarily in a really overt way, but Susan also has a book, of course, which uh, covers a lot of the themes we talked oh, about today. Yeah. On the lighter yeah. side of things... Uh, the Bonobo Way. Bonobo. Dr. Bono I'm sorry. Bo the Bonobo Way by Dr. Susan Bach. That's okay. You say Bonobo and I say Bonobo. <laughs> uh, actually, that's the French way. Bonobo. Yes. That's okay. And then I also have a new magazine, Speakeasy. Yeah. That's Is that available um, online uh, to purchase? Yeah, you can, you can get it at Amazon. Uh, it, the, this is our first issue, Splash and Art. Uh, Splash is a fetish, but I think you can enjoy it. And, of course, bonobos love to combine <laughs> food and sex. Yes. Great. Well, I think that's all we have time for for now. But thank you very much, uh, Dr. Susan Block. My pleasure. Um, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Beth. It's been a great conversation. Thank you, Susan. Hey.
and dongs and and cons, cam girls and friends. All you children sex, and we are all children of sex. We may or may not be children of God, Jesus, Allah, Buddha, Rama, or whatever you worship. And I, I worship them all. I, I'm, I'm, I'm loving them all. All the gods and the goddesses. But we don't know if we're children of any of them. But we do know, until we start cloning ourselves, we are all children of Sex, can I get another amen? Amen! amen. Yes. And of course, I'm a women. Amen! Yes, indeed, brothers and sisters, I want to welcome you to Bonoboville. Pleasure Palace. Yes, indeed. This is the womb room. Uh-huh. Yeah, where's my womb? Yeah, this is it. And the goddess Lady. rises from the vulva puppet. Yes, indeed, this is the womb room of the Dr. Susan Block Show, live from the little church, the little love church of Bonoboville. And uh, yeah, it's another Saturday night. Before I introduce my guests, I just want to say that I just did an interview with um, some gentlemen who are circulating around back there. They're sitting somewhere. back here with us. Robert and Pegasus. Yeah, they're drinking right. beer. Uh, they're Robert drinking Star. beer. They're getting stoned. <laughs> Man, they're all... Having a good time, but no bow way. Are they having sex? <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, no, they're great guys and uh, interesting questions. And they interviewed me about the incel phenomenon, which is, if you don't know what that means, it is uh, involuntary celibates. Um, the most extreme example would be Elliot Roger and uh, Alec Manassian, who actually are mass murderers. Although, in my opinion, a lot of mass murderers are kind of incels. They're, they're not having sex. Sexually repressed. Or if they're having sex, it's not very good. And maybe they're beating their wife, or maybe they're a closet homosexual, or maybe they really are identified as incels. Or maybe they're, they've been rejected by a girlfriend, uh, like the guy who shot up the Marjorie, um, well, the school in Florida. I forget the last. Marjorie Stoneman High. Okay, I should remember something like Stoneman. Okay. Yeah, it's Stoneman. Uh, anyway, they're, 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 they're not all mass murderers, okay? Yeah. In fact, very, very few. Although they are a little resentful of women and of men that they think are getting laid, but even more of women. And uh, it's kind of scary. It's kind uh, of uh, sobering. Um, and I believe you, we need to deal with it as a society. Um, not through locking them all up if they didn't commit crimes, no, uh, but through compassion. Not through calling them just toxic masculine people, even though they kind of are. Show compassion. Compassion. And what's the best way to show compassion that I know? The bonobo way. Uh, bonobo way. Go bonobos, <laughs> babe. That was another subject I talked with my interviewers about today was cunnilingus. <laughs> is anybody um, like not getting enough or do people want cunnilingus? Uh, um, uh, yeah. I can always yeah. get more. She's, I'm ready. You could always <laughs> get more. Okay. Sign me up. Because <laughs> they're kind of proposing, I mean, maybe there could be like an event where gals who uh, aren't getting enough cunnilingus can get it from guys who want to give it, who might be in cells, but I mean, they'd be vetted. They wouldn't I be murdered. I think <laughs> compromise. There's a Trumpus here who <laughs> needs to be spanked. Oh. And there's a interviewed me today about the incel phenomenon as well as a bunch of other subjects, and that would be Robert Stark and Pegasus. Uh, all right, so how you guys doing? Well, we're doing fantastic. Did you have a good interview with me earlier? Oh, we, we certainly did. Uh, <laughs> I think you're not. And did you have a good time watching the first half of the show? Yes, for yeah, sure. it's been wonderful. Okay. Been wonderful. And you, I see the book <laughs> is right on your lap. And just yes. in case we don't know that you're an author as well. <laughs> yeah, right. Got some really. Let's see. All right, now you have to take off your top. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, here he is. He's going to. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Also, yeah. Also, yeah Okay, so quickly, let's 
bring the trumpets on. Don't you grab her pussy? Yeah, don't keep don't on Don't you me. grab her pussy? Get, on your knee. Get down there. there. Tiny little BB. Here's <laughs> my paddle. <laughs> this oh, is for committing one. ecocide against the world. You're getting us all asthma. Stop it. You should care about the future generations. Mm. Worst guy for the earth. <laughs> And, of course, making a fool of America in front of the UN. And no, they were not laughing with you. They were laughing I at you. you. <laughs> wham, wham, They're wham, laughing at wham, you. wham, wham, wham. All right, that's enough of that. Go All sit right. in the corner. Somebody <laughs> should take charge of that. But no, we'll go rap master. Ecor, the wolf. Shout out to my bro, my big brother up in the building, Aristotle in the building, Fisk University. Yeah, Look how she shake that thing. Look how she make it bang. Look how she drop it low. Yeah, burn it and go. Come on. Look how she shake that thing. Look how she make it bang. Look how she drop it low. Yeah, burn it and go. Come on. She bad. I can't hear y'all. Come on. I can't hear y'all. She bad. What? What? So how, so how did it go, Robert? Good. Good? Yeah. This is Robert Stark. I'm on the set of uh, the Dr. Seuss Blossom. Dr. Seuss Blossom. 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 Blossom Green. Blossom Green. Uh, Susan's a wonderful assistant. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, I'm a little blossom that loves to dream. What do you think about our <laughs> What do you think about our documentary idea? As I step on your toe, I think that um, anyone that wants to honor Dr. Susie knows what's going on. Sexuality is reality. Cuddling. I like that. Oh. Sexuality is reality. Cuddling. Get sex. Cuddling quality. <laughs> Cuddling quality. Can you? Cuddling quality. Can you pronounce that? Cuddling quality. Yeah. Can I pronounce that? Did I just do it? You got awesome. I'm going to call me awesome. No, that's your shirt hanging. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, that's good. This guy's totally fixated on cunnilingus. Cunnilingus? I like cunnilingus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, It's my third show. Oh, yeah. That's good, too. Honey. Honey. Um, so how did you uh, how did you learn about Dr. Susie? From Dr. Susie? Yeah. I went to school for business and then I said I just want to be a kitty cat. Yeah, yeah. And you can send them to me or... And then I got this job. Nice. So I just keep this for a break. Indeed he does. Alright, so here we are in the... Uh, the showroom of Bonoboville. You and, uh, like you've had a transformation. I certainly have. Uh, <laughs> so. You had Bonoboville Communion. Uh, yes, you yes. got laid in Bonoboville. Yeah. Amazing transformation. So, uh, Dr. Susan Block, what role does uh, sexual frustration and the need to prove like your sexual status and social role and social hierarchies play in a modern day political discourse. Well, you know, um, modern day political discourse. I guess since the dawn of human civilization, we have had a politics that kind of plays with status. And of course, it everything involves 
one's sexuality. Sexuality is related to everything. It, it's what drives us. Sex is what brings us into the world, and sex is what motivates us to stay around for a while. And whether we are getting it, and we're happy, and we want to keep things good, or whether we're not getting it, and we're hoping that somehow a change will bring us the sexual satisfaction and joy that we really deserve, that we all deserve, um, you know, it, it does influence people's politics. It might make you vote for someone you identify with or someone you think is a savior that's going to save you. It might bring about a certain level of um, fascism, you could say, because you are so desperate, you're so frustrated that you want daddy, daddy fascist, daddy corporate chill, or mommy, but more often daddy, to save you. And uh, I don't think it's realistic, um, but it does uh, play a part. Now, on the other hand, you could be sexually frustrated and feel you want more liberal politicians in power so that you can enjoy your sexuality more, so that you can practice the benevolent way. Because when you have the corporate chills, the fascists, and the people in the pocket of the religious right, they are going to take your sexual rights away. And if you're frustrated now, wait till we have a religious theocracy. You will be much more frustrated. Ben, you were saying earlier a lot of the calls you get of the people with the most frustrations and difficulties are, in fact, conservatives. Yes, uh, often, a lot yeah. of the people that uh, are my best clients um, are very conservative, very religious. They're in the belt buckle of the Bible belt. And that's one reason they need to talk to a therapist, uh, is because they don't have anybody to talk to. Um, they need someone to tell their sexual feelings, their sexual fantasies, their sexual frustrations, their sexual problems. And, you know, I can't tell you how many people who go to a regular therapist can't talk to their regular therapist about their sexual feelings, either because they're politically incorrect or because they're embarrassed um, or because they just are told they shouldn't be talking about any kind of sex except married under the covers with Jesus watching. Yeah. Susan Block, it's been so great talking to you, very informative. Well, thank you so much, and I've uh, certainly had a good time with you too. How about a hug? <laughs>